Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, again, I'm Doran Barnes, and I serve as the volunteer policy leader of the Board of Directors of the American Public Transportation Association. It's the uh, best unpaid job I've ever had. Uh, one of the cool things is I get a chance to, uh, to come and visit with all of you. My day job is to serve as the executive director of Foothill Transit in suburban Los Angeles County. And in that role, I'm essentially a government official that leads the, pub, the suburban transit system. That system does contract out for day-to-day -day operation of service. And in a prior life, I spent 15 years as an employee and a member of the TransDev team. So I'm very familiar with the conversation that's happening here, the dialogue that's happening, and it's a, a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, this is my first visit to uh, Australia, and uh, I couldn't be more excited to, uh, to be with you. And hearing the conversations, I appreciate the warm welcome. I'm struck by how common the topics are in terms of conversation. Um, we're talking about performance management, we're talking about infrastructure investment, we're talking about long-term planning, and we're talking about what's happening in the future. Uh, so very, very similar conversations. Some things are quite similar, th some things are quite different. What I'll do here is walk through a little bit of a background on who APTA is as the uh, American Public Transportation Association, what's happening in terms of, of transit overall in the United States, some major trends and challenges, and then talk more about some of the mobility challenges and options and opportunities that are facing us. And again, you'll, you'll hear a lot of similarities in conversation. I'll touch on each of these. I'm sure we're gonna have many more opportunities to, uh, to talk about these more in depth, and uh, I suspect some of the conversation will need to occur with the cold beverage uh, over at the bar. There's probably a few conversations that may need a very stiff beverage over at the, at the bar, like the U.S. election, but uh, we won't get into that right now. Just to give you a little bit of an idea about, uh, about APTA and what we do, APTA was established in 1882 and uh, has a number of organizations that come together to create the organization that we are today. We have 95 full-time employees that support our organization, and we support and engage all modes of transportation, all modes of public transportation in the work that we do. So whether that's rail, whether that's uh, bus, whether that's fixed guideway, they all fit into the APTA umbrella. We have more than 1,500 members, and those include both public transit operators as well as suppliers and vendors on the private sector side. And we really bring together a very, very diverse group of individuals for the work that we do. Our blessing and our curse is that we have a very big tent, and that means there are lots of ideas, there's lots of energy, there's lots of excitement, and sometimes there's disagreement and of opinion in terms of how we move forward. But that's all part of the, the richness that brings us together as a trade association. <coughs> our, advocate, our, our efforts focus on a, a number of key areas, and, and at the top of the list there you'll see advocacy. One of the very important things that APTA does is to represent the public transport industry in Washington, D.C., where a significant portion of our funding overall comes. So we're making sure that, that APTA is the voice of our industry, we're expressing the needs to our policymakers, and ultimately both getting the resources that we need and working through the regulatory environment that comes with those resources. And that's a very, very important effort for us. But beyond that, we are, we are very much involved with education. Uh, we do a number of both large conferences and smaller scale seminars and workshops that are held throughout our country each year. We're involved with research, workforce development, and public and media outreach. And again, getting our story out in terms of what we're doing as an industry is extremely important. Do want to take a moment to, uh, to put up a commercial here and invite you all to come to our expo. Uh, we hold once every three years a major expo where we bring suppliers and vendors from throughout the world. This year we're going to be holding that event in Atlanta, Georgia, and I invite you to come and join me and 15,000 of my closest friends as we all gather together to uh, learn about the latest and greatest in the, uh, the transit industry. Now in terms of what's happening with public transport in the U.S. overall, just to give you a, a broad snapshot, Right now, every weekday we, we, uh, in the public transport sector, we transport 36 million rides, 10.6 uh, billion trips on an annual basis. Uh, we are a major industry at $64 billion with more than 400,000 direct jobs and supporting indirectly through the suppliers and vendors that support our industry almost 2 million jobs overall. So an important sector overall. If you look at that boarding number to give you some, some contrast, the U.S. population right now is at 320 million people. So we're, we're providing roughly 5 to 10% of the trips overall in the country. Certainly great growth opportunities for us as we go forward. And you can see that growth chart here, um, that, that growth trend on this chart, where you see population growth compared to transit growth. 
And transit has continued to be more and more popular in the states, very much driven in most of our communities by uh, the, the, the rampant vehicles, the private auto vehicles that are very much dominant in the states. But you can see transit is continuing to grow in terms of the, the mobility that we're providing and the good work that we're doing in the communities that we serve. You can also see that the, the modes and the uh, delivery of services is also shifting. One of the things that's been very exciting in the United States is the increased deployment of bus rapid transit as a mode, fixed guideway, but providing transit bus vehicles to provide those trips. Uh, again, you can see a tremendous amount of investment that's happening throughout the United States in terms of public transport overall. Now this chart shows on again a, a national basis where the revenue is coming from to support our industry. And you can see that the, the red piece of that, uh, of that pie is the federal funding, the national funding that we receive across the country to support public transport. Again, that's the piece that APTA is very much focused on in representing the industry in Washington, D.C. and advocating that that piece of the pie continue to grow. But what we've seen over time is that the other components of our funding continue to expand and play an, an ever-increasing role in terms of supporting the, the work that we do. Right now, we have an election coming up tomorrow um, that will be very important for a number of reasons. And while the focus has largely been what will happen at the, at the top of the race in terms of the United States president, there are a number of ballot measures across the country where local voters are considering taxing themselves to expand the level of investment that will be happening uh, in, in public transport. Just in Los Angeles County alone, we have a measure that will go before our voters that have approved will generate over $120 billion in funding that will allow us to expand our network and our program. Over $200 billion is on the ballot across the country. So it's a very important day for a number of reasons, and public transport is one of those very important topics that we'll be considering. Now in terms of trends, there are certainly some important trends that, uh, that we're seeing in the United States, and as I've had a chance to talk with many of you, um, there's some real similarities in terms of what's happening here in Australia. One of the trends that we're seeing is demographic and urbanization. And again, this is something that, um, uh, th that's happening in, in many parts of the world, but certainly in the United States, one of the major demographic trends that we're seeing is the, 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 the relationship between the boomers and the millennials. The boomers are now aging, and they're redefining what aging looks like. They want a lifestyle that provides mobility, that provides options, but in many cases means that their dependence on the private auto vehicle and their ability to drive is now diminishing. So we're seeing those boomers move back into um, the, the city environment. They're moving back into higher density housing. They're revitalizing our cities in some very exciting ways. At the other end of that spectrum, you have a major age group, the millennials, the group that's in the 19 to 37 year old age range that are also finding that urban living is very much in line with what they're looking for in terms of lifestyle choices. So both of these groups that in the past, had, had, especially the boomers, really drove the, the move to suburbanization, are now reversing that, coming back to our cities and reviving our city, cities in some very, very exciting ways. That for us in the public transport arena is a very, very important trend that allows us to really focus on how we serve this changing demographic. And again, you can see this and, and you see this in many spaces. I was uh, in downtown Perth yesterday, saw a number of, of uh, higher density uh, housing units that are going in place, again, taking advantage of what's happening. We're seeing that in, in the United States, not only in our big cities, but also in our medium and small size cities where people are moving from the suburbs back into the city centers. Another thing that we're seeing and that we track very closely is the link between transport and economic growth. Uh, APTA, in its research effort, uh, does a number of, of activities that focus on capturing that data. And what we're seeing is that where transportation investments are made, there are a whole host of other investments that happen once those, those transportation investments occur. So what we're seeing is that around bus stations, around uh, metro stops, that once those services come into play, there's housing that goes into play, there's business activity that goes into play. One of the things we say at APTA is that where public transportation goes, community grows. And we have research that actually demonstrates that's happening. It's a very exciting trend and very important as we make the case for continued investment in public transportation. Another area that we're focused on very much in the United States is the link between energy and the environment and sustainability. 
we all live on this great planet Earth together and how we care for it or fail to care for it is important for all of us. Uh, we're seeing a, a huge shift in the use of fuel types. And I think, again, as we look to what the future might bring, uh, we've seen nat the use of compressed natural gas as a fuel that has increased significantly. About 27% of the current orders uh, in the US market are, are compressed natural gas. Um, diesel and, and electric hybrid buses are continuing to expand. Uh, you can see diesel fuel is still a primary fuel. But the one that's really exciting, and the one to keep a close eye on, is the electric battery vehicles. And we are seeing a tremendous amount of excitement and investment and involvement in the electric vehicle market. Uh, at Foothill Transit, the organization that, um, that I operate, uh, we've actually been one of the leaders in the deployment of electric vehicles. We were the first to develop fast charge electric vehicles and have the current largest fleet, and I say that at a fleet of 17, so that's not uh, all that whopping. But our board has made a commitment that our entire 350 bus fleet by the year 2030 will be using electric vehicles. There's lots to be learned. There are lots of uncertainties now in terms of how those vehicles will be used, but we're definitely pushing in that direction. And we're not alone. There are systems across the United States that are looking to deploy battery electric vehicles in a 100% battery operation. Certainly a trend line that we need to watch very, very closely. Now in terms of technologies, um, one of the, the areas, again, as we've, as we've heard here, is how do we use technology? How do we use data? There are a lot of efforts that are underway to better use data. We've seen the impact. Everyone has their, their smartphone, where now customers expect real-time information, where data is plentiful. But the real challenge becomes how do you get good quality data that results in meaningful information that gets to our customers? Again, this is something we're talking about tremendously. We're making big investments to be able to tap that data, that mountain of data to better be able to serve our customers. I thought it was interesting that, um, that we started today with the video of Ollie, um, the, the, uh, the new autonomous vehicle. And um, I actually had a chance to go to Local Motors, which is located uh, just outside of uh, Washington, D.C., and toured their facility there. One of the things they didn't say in the video is that Ollie is actually a 3D printed vehicle which is pretty cool. I saw the process on how that all came together. Um, I also saw the, the, the bits and pieces that were all over the floor and all the cool stuff they say that Ollie can do in that video. They're not quite there yet. But the other thing that I found striking in meeting with the folks at Local Motors is that that organization is run by people who really don't know that much about public transport and aren't burdened by any of the historical information or the knowledge they're run by really, really smart people who are trying really creative things that are going to move us in some interesting directions. Now, Ollie may be the, the thing that's on every street corner in a couple of years. Ollie, Ollie may be something that goes down in the history books and only time will tell. But I think the, the story of Ollie tells us that there are things that are happening, these trends that we've been talking about, we have to watch very, very closely. And we are certainly doing that as we're having conversations with our partners at Apto. Now, in terms of shared use and integrated mobility, uh, again, it's, it's very interesting to hear the conversation here because it's very much a part of the conversation in the United States. We traditionally in the United States as, as transit operators have often thought about our vehicles, our schedules, our assets, very much isolated to the things that we do and not to the broader network. But what we're seeing is that people are shifting. People are thinking about mobility as a whole range, a whole suite of options. It might be bike share, it might be on-demand services, public transport's a part of that. And I think the real question as we sit here today and as we're talking about this is, what is the role of the bus operator in this changing landscape? And I think the, the thing that I come away with each time I have one of these conversations is, we're not quite sure. But the conversation is happening, the evolution is occurring, and we've got to be continually engaged and asking ourselves that processing new data as we go forward because we know the world is changing and we know that things are going to be different. One of the things, again, it, that APTA has done in our research area was to look at uh, what's happening in terms of the mobility on-demand services. And I've got to say, to some extent, we, we've been a little bit unsure. Are the new mobility on-demand services friends or foe? Not quite sure. But one of the things that we did was we conducted a research study to better understand what was happening. And what we found was that the most popular destination in terms of pickups pick and drop-offs for Uber 
is a public transit stop. Now, if you think about that, and if we can take advantage of these mobility on demand services to, to create these first and last mile linkages, and we can provide the longer haul services with high quality service, there could be a real synergy in terms of how all that connects. So the early research is telling us that there is some great synergy that's happening here, but also a lot of market change, a lot of disruption that's happening, and we've got to keep a close eye on this as, as it goes forward. We have follow-on work that we're going to be doing to continue to look at what's happening, what are those market changes, what are those market trends. We've been excited that um, a number of these organizations have chosen to join our association. Um, all of the companies that you see pictured here in terms of their logos are now APTA members, and we're looking for ways to engage them in the conversation in terms of what the future looks like. Again, we don't know what that looks like, they don't know what that looks like, but we've all got to be talking together about how do we create the best future that we possibly can. Now in terms of, of integrated mobility, and um, again, as you talk about um, you know, what you're doing from a bus operator standpoint and how you integrate these things, we've talked about this a lot as well. And we've adopted some principles related to how we integrate mobility in terms of what we're doing. And a lot of this talks about creating one-stop shopping, being able to look at trip links, being able to look at how we serve those customers, not just from the standpoint of the bus trip, but from the standpoint of the entire journey from beginning to end, and how bus, and in our case, how rail, fits into that overall journey. What does that begin to look like? And how do we make sure that we're really having that customer focus in mind? Again, some additional principles that we adopted in terms of how we're going forward. Um, this is evolving, this is changing. And it's a conversation that I know we're going to continue to have, that we're going to continue to struggle with. Um, in many respects, we talk about how do we look to the future, and yet at the same time, how do we support our members in doing the things that they've done day in and day out in terms of core service? We've gotta be able to do both. We've gotta be able to pull that all together. There are lots and lots of examples of experiments that are happening in the United States where uh, our different transit systems are doing different things to try to figure out and test and push and pull on these activities. Our friends at the Dallas Area Rapid Transit uh, System have partnered with Lyft, Uber, and Zipcar, and their focus has been on how do you accomplish those first mile, last mile trips that get people to the high quality service that DART is off offering. Uh, DART's had very, very positive response to the initial outreach on this and is looking to continue to explore and expand how do you create that overall journey so that the customers will use the services that we're providing to make all of this happen. Um, in Florida, the Pinellas Suncoast Transit, Transit Authority, they've taken a slightly different approach where they've looked at some of the trips that are being provided or have been provided using fixed route bus, but had very, very low ridership in terms of those services. So low, low ridership means high cost per ride. What they've done is work with the on-demand services to subsidize a portion of that trip, thereby eliminating the high cost trip by bus, but still providing the mobility option for those customers. Uh, again, they're looking at, uh, at, at, at what does all this look like? It's, it's an experiment in terms of how it all comes together. And there are many more that are out there. Uh, in my system at uh, Foothill Transit, we're partnering with Los Angeles Metro and the Federal Transit Administration, which has launched what they call their, their mobility sandbox. And uh, you might think that's a bit of an odd name, but the idea is that you get into this environment and try different things, experiment with different things, and see how, it, how they all come together. It's a big challenge for us. Uh, much of the regulatory environment that we operate with in the United States is based on solid 1960s thinking. Um, we have a lot of legacy in terms of how we've gotten to this point uh, that really creates some impediments in terms of how we, how we in, in embrace and pull together this mobility on demand type of service. Uh, but the good news is that we're having these conversations much like you're having them. There's so much we can learn from each other and I look forward to, to continuing to have the, uh, the dialogue. Um, again, some of the benefits, and I think these are all um, things that we're all aware of in terms of the benefits of ride sharing and, and creating these partnerships. Again, it's all about creating the, the, the overall trip and creating the mobility that our, our customers, that our residents uh, need to be able to live great lives, whether that's supporting economic activity, whether that's improving the social environment in which we're operating. And with that, um, Sam, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you.